Okay, uh, thank you, and thanks also for, for the invitation. Uh, I'm happy uh, to have the opportunity uh, to, to give a talk uh, here today. Okay, so as Joanna just, uh, just said, I will be talking about um, formal protocol verification, and in particular uh, about, uh, about equivalence properties and what happens if we have probabilities. So uh, let me just remind you what we are talking about when we are talking about symbolic verification of security protocols. So uh, this goes actually back quite a long time, uh, now nearly 40 years to the seminal ideas of, um, of Dolev and Yao. And the main ingredients are kind of the following. The first thing is that we suppose a quite strong adversary, which is actually completely controlling the network. So this adversary may intercept messages, modify them, inject them. He can basically do what he wants about redirecting messages and modifying them. So the adversary moreover is computationally unbounded. But um, in order for this to make sense, we also need to take some, some, some hypothesis. So um, as he's computationally unbounded, uh, we have to suppose that cryptography is perfect. So this is usually done using uh, by representing, uh, representing messages rather than having them as bit strings with logical terms and equational theories. So for instance, the very standard equation to model encryption is to say that, well, if I'm encrypting a message M with a key K and some randomness R, because encryption should be, pro should be randomized and I'm decrypting it again, well, um, then I'm getting back the same message M. So basically encryption and decryption cancel out. So this is something that you have all seen, I guess. And the important part is there's no other possible way of decrypting or breaking this, this encryption. So there's no way of, of, of performing some cryptanalysis of, or anything like that, even not with non-negligible probability. And this is also related to the fact that actually we have what I call here unguessable random random values, unguessable random numbers. So basically this is uh, modeled using what I, I've written here as new R. And so basically rather than sampling a random number from a finite domain as it is done computationally, here we will suppose that we have actually an infinite set of such random values. And each time that we need one, we're picking a fresh one. So it means they are really unguessable and um, there's no way of, uh, of breaking of breaking this. And finally, uh, protocols, they will be modeled typically as transition systems. And often they are specified by some process algebra or process calculus uh, to, to have a more convenient way of writing them down. So many of you have probably seen automated tools that are able to analyze uh, protocols in these models. Some of the very famous tools are, for instance, Proverif or Tamarin. Um, there's also uh, Mod MPA or DeepSec that I, I was involved in, um, but there are, there are many others. These are just, uh, just examples. And of course, these tools also have many scalps on their belts. They have found weaknesses in many, uh, many important protocols. Here are just some examples. So for instance, uh, TLS has been widely studied, both 1.2 and the new version 1.3. And so, um, People from this formal methods community and formal uh, analysis of, uh, of, uh, of protocols have actually contributed to the design of TLS 1.3. So there has been a big effort working uh, with, um, with the TLS working group in designing uh, version 1.3. There have also been um, attacks on, uh, on protocols from mobile telephony with 3G, 3G and 5G. So there have been papers where they have shown, for instance, that it is possible to link um, different phone calls uh, and things like that. And for uh, 5G, they, had, they have been even able on a first draft to break authentication and things like that. I've been works on instant messaging and e-voting and many, many, many other, other protocols. And so this is just to say that um, these tools are working actually uh, quite nicely and have been able to analyze um, real world deployed protocols. And just looking uh, once more at these symbolic models, one of the things that we can note is that they completely abstract away probabilities. 
as I already pointed out, we don't have really random samplings, we are taking fresh names. And cryptographic primitives are kind of supposed to be perfectly secure. So you cannot, for instance, break it with negligible probabilities as it is in, um, in computational cryptographic models. And I believe that actually these, these choices of saying what is what happens with negligible probabilities is just abstracted away as being impossible is actually quite nice because it allows to focus on uh, on really uh, some of the important um, ideas of how the protocol works and things like that. And it has shown to be to, to be helpful um, having these tools in practice. But one of the things is that we also completely abstract away uh, probabilities in the, execute, in the execution flow. So you cannot, for instance, say what's probability one half, I will do one action or probability one half, I'll do something else. And here when I'm saying one half, I mean, this could be really in the, in the execution flow. And so it's not a negligible probability. So this is something that we will be looking into today. And in particular, in the context of indistinguishability properties. So many security properties can actually be modeled as indistinguishability. So this typically says I cannot distinguish between two situations. So typically, if you think about anonymity, you would say, well, I cannot distinguish the protocol executed by Alice or the protocol executed by Bob. That would be a very simple property, an anonymity property that I could model using indistinguishability. And so in, in many of these symbolic uh, models, um, we actually build on this kind, this this uh, on process equivalences to model indistinguishability. So one example, one typical example that you may think of could be as May testing. And so for May testing equivalents, you would say that P and Q, they are May testing equivalent. If they behave in exactly the same way, even in the presence of an arbitrary process A that models the attacker or the adversary. So what I'm saying here is that A in parallel with P behaves exactly in the same way as A in parallel with Q and behaving in the same way uh, is here modeled by this, what is called a Bob, by the ability of uh, a process sending a message on channel C. So intuitively the idea would be to say that if A believe that he is an, um, in presence of P, he should send a signal or message on, on channel C. And what the property says that, well, actually, even in, in the presence of Q, he will send a, a message, a, a signal on channel C at exactly the same, uh, same moments. So the intuition is that these uh, processes cannot be distinguished. Uh, and um, this by an arbitrary process, by an arbitrary program, A, that I can write in my language. So what about the following example? So I would have rather argued that this is the definition here is quite strong as we're saying that we are looking at um, arbitrary universally quantif quantification over all possible processes that I can work. So what about the following example? So my example is quite simple. I'm saying I have um, a process P here where I have three instances of A that each uh, encrypt output an encrypted bit, twice zero and once one. So here it is, that is modeled by this process AX, which basically just encrypts X and outputs it. And in parallel, I have a decryption oracle. So this decryption oracle is taking an input and just decrypting it with this secret key K. And the only difference between these two processes, P and Q, is that in P, I have two copies of A that output zero encrypted and once one encrypted. And Q, it's the converse. So we have one zero and two ones. And importantly, I have one single call to this decryption oracle. So I just have one copy here. And if you look at these two processes, well, they are perfectly may testing equivalent. 
And you can you can check this with uh, with existing tools. For instance, you can enter this into DeepSec, what I've done, and it will prove you that these two processes are completely made testing equivalent. Meaning for any process that I write in, in, in the applied PyCAD, which is here the modeling language that I'm, I'm using, they cannot be distinguished. But uh, if you look at this a little bit, uh, if you think about it, there's actually a very easy way, easy distinguisher, which would be probabilistic. So what the attacker could do is just take one of these outputs, which are given in an arbitrary order, in a non-deterministic order, because uh, the parallel operator here schedules them in a non-deterministic order. And then he's just making a probabilistic choice about which, um, which encrypted bit to submit to the decryption oracle. Well, if the output is zero, then the attacker can guess that he's more likely to be in process P. While if the decryption says one, then he's much more likely to be in, uh, in presence of Q. And so intuitively, I would have expected uh, for these to be indistinguishable that there could only be a negligible advantage. So what we see here is that actually these two processes can be distinguished. And maybe one important note is that P and Q themselves are not probabilistic. So what I'm saying here is actually, if we are adding the possibility to uh, basically uh, make probabilistic choices to the attacker, to the language, then I'm adding distinguishing power to the attacker, even if the processes that I'm studying at the beginning are actually completely non-deterministic, so they don't have any probabilistic choice. Okay, so this is kind of a motivating example why we should look into this. What is happening if I'm adding this possibility to make probabilistic choices? And so the language that we will uh, consider as uh, a probabilistic version of the applied pi calculus, which was first introduced by um, Gubo, uh, Palamidesi, and, um, and Troina in 2007. And so it's basically the standard applied pi calculus plus probabilistic choice. So we have possibility to input messages, to output messages. We have parallel composition, so we can run process in parallel. We can have an unbounded number of these sessions, so we have replication. So we can take an unbounded number of copies of P. We can have restriction, which models these kind of random numbers, conditional. Uh, here we also consider, uh, consider non-deterministic choice, but which, is, which can actually be encoded uh, using uh, using the rest of the calculus, but it's more convenient to have it. And then we have this probabilistic choice where we're saying, well, for instance, execute P with probability, let's say one third, and Q with probability two thirds. So, so we are just adding this, uh, this, uh, this new operator here and enriching our language. Okay, and so I won't go into all the formal details of, um, of the operational semantics, but what we need to remember is here that this gives me actually a transition system, which is both non-deterministic and probabilistic. So I'm just having here a little example where you were saying here, basically from P, I can uh, move to having to executing both A and B because P was the parallel composition of A and B. And in A, I actually have a probabilistic choice. So here I'm having a transition, which is actually a probability distribution. So with one third, probability one third, I'm going up here. And with probability two third, I'm going down here. And it's always actually a probability distribution, but in many cases, the probability will be one. So there will be the rack uh, distributions here. And then what I see is sometimes I can also have non-deterministic choice. For instance, in this state here, zero B1, I can either go up to B1 or take a different distribution which is going here to the right to zero zero. So this is just um, just to, 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 to show you that we can have sometimes a non-deterministic choice between two probability distributions. And if we want to reason now about these transition systems, for instance, to compute the probability of reaching a given state, we need to solve first the non-determinism. 
So we're calling this resolutions. Uh, sometimes this is also called schedulers. And basically we're saying, well, when there is a non-deterministic choice, like here on this state where we can either go up or go to the right, well, then the scheduler or the resolution needs to make a choice. So here on the right, I would, for instance, choose to go to the right-hand side and go from 0B1 to 0, 0, while another choice would have been to go up to B1. So this would be uh, just to have a schedule. And actually, what we have noted is, um, and as we will see, this will be important, one can also um, consider randomized schedulers, where rather than saying, I have to choose between going up or going to the right, I can actually say, well, I'm taking a distribution over these two choices. So with probability three fourths, I'm going up. With probability one fourth, I'm going to the right. And in our work, we will actually consider all possible distributions about the choices that the scheduler could make. So rather than saying that the scheduler needs to choose uh, between one or the other, we're saying it can take an arbitrary distribution to model the scheduler. And um, here I have, uh, I have shown it with this uh, very simple kind of distribution where we just had, where it was a Dirac distribution, but of course it could have been a more complicated distribution here. And then you would just scale them. So three fourths of one distribution and one fourth of the other distribution. So I won't go into, into all the details. And an important comment is that in previous work, actually only non-randomized resolutions had been considered. And as we will see, this is actually a problem and, um, and we will discuss this in our results, why this is a problem. And so now that we um, have talked about resolutions, we can actually discuss what it means to have May testing or the May testing pre-order here um, uh, in presence of such probabilities. And so what we will say is that um, once we have resolved uh, all the non-determinism, we can compute what is the probability of this process A in parallel is P reaching a state where we can output on C. So this R prob is, means the probability to reaching a state where A parallel P can output on C. And we're actually taking the scheduler that maximizes this probability here. And so we're saying that if uh, A in parallel with P can, AL can output on C with a given probability, then A in parallel with Q can output on channel C with at least the same probability. And if you want to have May testing equivalence, like here you're taking just the pre-order in both directions. Okay, I hope this makes sense. So we're asking that each, each time that a process can output on C with a given probability, the other process can do it with at least the same probability also output on C. So this is actually the, the notion of May testing that we will introduce here. And as, as it is often done um, when you're doing this kind of um, process equivalences, we, uh, we want to actually get rid of this for all processes A, this for all quantification. And that is why people actually introduce labeled semantics, where rather than um, explicitly quantifying over all attackers, we're actually saying, well, we can include the attacker actions in labels. So typically here, if there's an input available, while this input could be given by the attacker, if, it is, if these are messages that the attacker can deduce and we're recording them in the labels. And so rather than putting an attacker in parallel, we are actually just uh, giving uh, the attacker, uh, specifying the attacker on the labels that can be done and moving from an, just an unlabeled transition system to a labeled one. And here we are also adding something which is related to the tests that, peer, that the attacker can make so he can uh, have a transition that is possible if some test that he's making, some equality test that he's making on previous outputs holds. Uh, for those who are familiar with the applied pie calculus, this is kind of encoding the static equivalence in, um, uh, on frames. I won't go too much into the details, but I just wanted um, to step back a little bit and give you um, 
kind of a little bit of a reminder of all these equivalences that exist, what I call here the equivalent zoo. And I'm looking at it just without probabilities, what the picture was like before. So um, the two equivalences that have been uh, that have been considered in many works, uh, going back, for instance, to the spy calculus, are this testing, May testing equivalents that I introduced. But if you look at the applied pi calculus, they looked at observational equivalence, which is slightly stronger. So um, this is therefore I have this implication here. And then um, in their paper, uh, Martin Abadi and Cedric Fournier showed that this can be that there is a labeled version here that actually coincides with observational equivalence, which is called bisimilarity. So there you are taking the label transition system and you're just asking for bisimilation between uh, between two labeled uh, transition systems. And uh, then um, if you think about tools like Proverif or Tamarin, they are actually not able to really prove observational equivalence. They're proving actually something stronger, which is called diff equivalence, because it's easier to prove. And um, that's what I just said, that this is too fine-grained for several pro uh, properties, typically for if you want to, for instance, to to model unlinkability in some applications. And this is too fine-grained, but much easier to prove. That's why Proverif is doing it. Um, other people, uh, Vincent Chabal and uh, Stéphanie Delon and Véronique Cartier, have actually also looked at trace equivalence, which is actually the same as test made testing equivalence, but the labeled version. And from the definition, it all also follows directly that by similarity implies trace equivalence. So this, this implication is just given is straightforward from the definition, while these equivalences, they are quite hard to show between the labeled and the unlabeled uh, semantics. Because here you have a testing equivalent, the observational equivalence. You're putting an arbitrary adversary in parallel, while for trace equivalence and by similarity, you're just considering the labeled transition systems. You do, so you don't have this arbitrary attack in parallel. So this is actually quite convenient when you want to make, to make proofs. And in this work, we're actually looking at something uh, which is well known uh, in formal methods, but has not been uh, considered quite, um, quite that much in, the, in security, which is similarity. So this is a simulation relation in both directions, which is slightly different from bisimulation, which means that you need to have a same, to have a simulation and the, um, and and and, to, uh, and um, the inverse of this of the simulation that that give you the bisimilarity relation. So you, here you have one same relation which relates both processes, while in similarity you have simulation in both directions, which is slightly different. But if you're not familiar familiar with this, it's that's not very important. So there are kind of a lot of different um, equivalents of, equivalences that have been considered. Okay. And moreover, um, what has been also shown is that for a given class of determinate processes, these equivalences actually all coincide, except if equivalence. That's just a side remark. So determinate processes are one where you have very little non-determinism. I won't go into the details. So this is kind of the situation. This is the picture that we have um, when we are looking at um, at a non-probabilistic case. And if we're adding um, probabilities, we're actually also fa facing another problem, is that if we're mixing non-determinism and probabilities, this generally gives you kind of counterintuitive examples. So let me show you one of these. Um, let's start with the process Q here. The process Q, what, what it is doing is just taking an input and then with probability one half, it will output on the channel okay. And from probability one half, it will output on channel bad. While the process P is slightly more involved, it will say with probability one half, I will take an input. And if it is equal to zero, then I'm outputting on channel okay. Otherwise, if it's different from zero, I output on, on channel bad. And on the other side, the other branch, which is also executed with probability one half, if x equals zero, 
then I'm doing the converse. I'm outputting on bad, and otherwise, if it's different from zero, I'm outputting on okay. So intuitively, as the attacker, if the attacker does not know in which of these branches we are, he can actually not know whether he should send zero or one or something else, and whether he will output or get an output on okay or output on bad. So intuitively, one would expect that these two processes would be indistinguishable. But what is actually happening is that um, these two processes can be uh, distinguished by this very simple attack, which just, just says, in, uh, in parallel, I will output either zero or output one on channel C. And the reason why this process can distinguish um, the processes is because the resolution, the scheduler actually can leak in some sense to the adversary what, which probabilistic choice has been taken. So if we're going in the first branch here, the scheduler could say, well, if I'm in this branch, I will actually schedule out C0 here and I will output OK. If I have, I'm in the second branch, then the scheduler will output one. And so I'm still outputting OK. So which means that there is a scheduler that with probability one in P will do an output on OK, while this one does not exist in Q. In, in Q, Basically, the whether I'm outputting on OK or bad is completely independent of the input. So uh, here I'm still having probability one half to output on, on OK. So these two processes could be distinguished, while intuitively one might consider uh, that these, um, these processes should be considered as indistinguishable. And this is actually a very well-known problem uh, that uh, it is complicated to mix non-determinism and uh, probabilities. And there have been people that have been looking at um, how can we restrict schedulers so that they don't leak um, the probabilistic choices. One example of this work was, for instance, by Kostas Shati Kokolakis and uh, Katusha Palamidesi. But there, there are many, many people who have looked into this. And I don't think there are any really completely satisfactory solutions for this. And we're kind of not solving this problem here. And what we decided is to rather look at two subclasses of process that are kind of well behaved and avoid uh, this problem. The first subclass of, of processes are non-probabilistic processes. So this is what we are actually already doing with tools like Proverif and Tamarine and DeepSync and all this, uh, these tools. We're looking at processes that don't make um, probabilistic choices which are all our models of TLS of, and all these protocols that we already have. But this time we're considering a probabilistic attacker. So we're saying the processes don't make probabilistic choices, but the attacker that we're putting in parallel that is trying to distinguish has to write, has the power of making probabilistic choices. And the other class is what we call fully probabilistic processes, um, where we basically have very limited forms of non-determinism only. So in the first class, basically for non-probabilistic processes, there's no probabilistic choice that the resolution can leak. And in the fully probabilistic processes, well, there is actually not enough non-determinism also to leak the probabilistic choices to influence the attacker uh, behavior. And this is kind of the probabilistic version of determinate processes. One can think of it like this. And we'll see what's happening for these two, two subclasses, even though we have a formalism for extending and defining everything, even in more general classes. But all I'm saying is that um, if we're considering more general classes, then actually maybe the distinguishing power is, is too strong because a resolution can lead probabilistic choices. And I'm just summarizing here um, kind of the results and uh, with a few highlights before focusing a little bit on, uh, on some of them. So um, the first thing that we should note as I have been talking about the importance of looking at randomized schedulers saying that, well, actually we should not just consider schedulers that choose the first or the second non-deterministic choice, but one which can take an arbitrary um, 
distribution over all possible non-deterministic choices. And what we have actually shown is that if you look at similarity with non-deterministic, uh, with non-probabilistic resolutions, well, actually this definition of similarity is not transitive anymore. So this is something where you get really uh, very strange definitions. And so we are not the first to know this. This is something that is well known for people that doing that are working uh, on transition systems, on, on probabilistic uh, transition systems. They are very well aware of this problem so that you get bad definitions. And we actually were able to show that because uh, in this earlier work on the, on the probabilistic applied pi calculus, they were um, considering uh, only um, non-randomized schedulers. Well, in that case, we actually have a counterexample to the main theorem that is saying that observational equivalence is the same as by similarity. So we have a counterexample to this. And this is solved actually if you take the definitions that we have with randomized schedulers. And more globally, so we are showing that actually similarity with randomized schedulers that I'm having here is different from similarity with some randomized schedulers, which is different from observational if, equivalence if you take non-randomized schedulers and so on. While in our setting where we can, which is more general, we can have randomized schedulers, we're showing as expected that we actually can show the usual result that um, similarity and also by simulation coincide with observational uh, pre well, simulation and observational pre-order coincide and by simulation and observational equivalence coincide. And then we have um, the usual um, implications like uh, well, simulation implies trace equivalence and for trace equivalence and meta testing uh, equivalence, actually it doesn't matter whether you uh, consider non-randomized schedulers or randomized schedulers. And this is kind of an in interesting result because reasoning about non-randomized schedulers is nevertheless easier actually to do. And another interesting result, I believe, is which is, uh, I think, one of the most interesting insights of our work is that if we're taking processes that are non-probabilistic and restrict it to a bounded number of sessions, so if we remove replications, then we can actually show that may testing with probabilistic at first race is exactly the same as uh, similarity where you don't have any probabilities at all. So we're looking at non-probabilistic processes, we're taking similarity where you don't have any uh, probabilities in it. And this is coincides with May testing where you actually take a probabilistic at first rate. So this is, this is something that I found interesting. And for similarity, actually, we also inherit um, complexity results in the decision procedure in the paper where we presented deep sex. So we know that uh, we have precise complexity, we have uh, a decision procedure that works already for similarity, which means that for non-probabilistic processes, we can actually decide may testing with probabilistic at first reads. So I will go a little bit more in, um, in this result because uh, I think it's, uh, it gives you really interesting, it's a really interesting insight saying that if we take non-probabilistic Finite, so without replication processes P and Q. So this is basically the class that DeepSec is, uh, uh, is, is working on. Then P simulates Q if and only if P is in the May testing pre-order with Q. And the proof is actually conceptually quite simple. So it's basically a, a three-step proof. So we're taking an LTSL, which is image finite, which will be the case because uh, we have finite processes. And for this, the simulation here, simulation relation coincides with strong simulation. So in simulation, we have this uh, silent action, the internal actions that are kind of not considered. Uh, and this coincides with strong simulation on a corresponding LTS, which I call the weak LTS. And basically what you do is that if you have um, some, some internal actions followed by visible actions and some internal actions, you just add a transition which goes directly there. So it's just a standard construction 
where you say, if previously I, I had a weak transition, now I will add a visible transition, corresponding visible transition directly. And what we know, as this is a known result, is that if, while P is in simulation with Q on the, on the LTSL, then I have the strong simulation on this weak LTS. On this weak LTS. But this is the first step. So I'm moving from simulation to strong simulation. And well, for strong simulation, I actually know that we have uh, hennessy milner logic characterization. So just let me remember what is a hennessy milner logic characterization. So hennessy milner logic is very simple. We have these three kinds of formula. The first one is just true. That is basically a holds on any state. Then I'm saying A, which is a label, a formula A holds when I can execute the transition A in S and go to T where the remaining of the formula holds. And while well, I have conjunction, so this is, uh, this is, this is uh, the usual, uh, usual semantics for conjunction. And the characterization, which is a known result, so this is not, uh, this is not novel, is that if S strongly simulates T, then we have that any formula that holds on S also holds on, on T in the state T. So just remember this, that we have this hennessy milner logic characterization. And the third step, this is where we, um, uh, which is kind of the novel thing, is that what we are saying, well, we can actually encode each of the hennessy milner logic formulas as an adversary. So what we are saying is that we can build an adversary depending on this formula F, which if I'm actually putting it in parallel of the process P, then it will output on channel C with probability one, if and only if formula F holds. And the way that we construct this adversary is actually quite, quite straightforward. So if the label in my formula uh, F is an input, well then the adversary will just provide corresponding output. If it is a test, then my adversary will do a conditional. If it is true, then my adversary will output on C. And here where the probability is, is necessary for my, uh, for my adversary is for conjunction. And here the idea is if I'm saying that F1 and F2 should hold, well, I'm just taking a probabilistic choice here. And what I know is what I can, what I observe is that I will output on C with probability one only, oh, sorry, only if in both branches here, F1 and F2, I will output on C. And so this is just the trick to use this probability choice to kind of say encode this conjunction. And now what I'm showing here, my proof sketch is from the right to left direction because the other one is, is, is much easier as that if I suppose that P is actually in the May testing uh, relation with Q, then I know that if P um, uh, will um, output on C with probability one in, in, uh, in presence of this adversary F, then Q will do so as well. This is my hypothesis because they are in the May testing equivalence. So if P in parallel with adversary F outputs one, then Q will do so, outputs on C with probability one, well, then Q will do so as well. And therefore, any formula that holds on P will hold on Q. And therefore, I have the hennessy milner uh, um, characterization for, for both P and Q. And I can get back to strong simulation and get, can back, I can get back to the similarity. So I can, um, in these three, three steps, I can quite easily, using some known results on transition systems, prove, uh, prove this, uh, this, uh, this theorem. And the other subclass, which I will just very shortly talk about, is about fully probabilistic processes. And what are they? They're just parallel composition of components P1, Pn. Think of these as being kind of the roles of my, of my protocol. And each of these PIs, they don't have any non-deterministic choice, no parallel inside, no replication. So they're kind of linear processes here, but they can have, um, probabilistic choice. And moreover, each PI uses a different channel CI for all inputs and outputs, so or distant channels. So PI and PJ for I different from J will use different channels for the inputs and outputs. 
So this means that there cannot be, for instance, an internal communication between PI and, uh, and PJ. So it needs necessarily to go through the adversary. And also if I'm seeing an output, the adversary knows which process that sent it. And for this, for this class of probabilistic uh, processes, uh, we can actually characterize trace equivalence um, by knowing, by observing that or showing that um, FP is on the trace pre-order of Q, then P is actually in a slightly particular mate testing pre-order with Q, where the attacker is actually also fully determined. So the attacker can make probabilistic choices, but it may not use plus a parallel or replication. But I can really characterize what it means to be a trace equivalent in terms of over of, of mate testing, which gives us uh, interesting insights, I believe. And moreover, which I didn't write here, but it's, it's quite easy to adapt actually the decision procedure of uh, DeepSec to uh, trace equivalence with a probability operator here. And so if I'm taking um, these fully probabilistic processes and I adapt the deep sack algorithm, I could decide um, this determinate may testing um, equivalence using deep sack. Okay, just to conclude, I think um, you have seen a few interesting insights. The first one is really the importance um, of using randomized schedulers when you want to define this, um, these equivalences. We have come up with a kind of extensive um, picture of what are the relation between the different behavioral and label pre-orders and equivalences. And what I think is uh, the interesting, really interesting uh, results are that we can actually have two subclasses for which we have a real characterization of may testing versus trace equivalence or similarity. And in particular, we now know that if we have um, non-probabilistic processes, meaning the thing that we have been analyzing for 40 years now, while well, if you look at just uh, trace equivalence, you're actually missing the power of a probabilistic adversary. And if you want to have a probabilistic adversary you can actually consider similarity and completely forget about the probabilities, but this is equivalent. And so uh, as future works, we actually um, would like to extend deep sec. So as I already said, have trace equivalence with a probabilistic choice operator. This is not that difficult uh, to do actually algorithmically speaking. And it would be also uh, good to implement decision procedures for similarity and by similarity while we actually, um, we have theoretical decision procedures, but they are highly non-deterministic. And if we want to implement them in, in a tool, there's, there's more, more work to be done to make them more operational. Um, otherwise, this will, this, will, this will not be a realistic implementation. Other things that would be interesting to look at are, for instance, can we nevertheless restrict the schedulers and more general classes of processes to, to get, um, more realistic indistinguishability behaviors. So avoid that the scheduler can leak actually the probabilistic choices. And another thing which is maybe a little bit more speculative is what about more quantitative equivalences like distances? So rather than saying that they must have exactly the same probability to output on a channel C or have exactly the same behavior, we might be able uh, to take these quantitative equivalences and measure the distance. And one of the applications of this uh, might be if you think about um, security specifications where you compare a protocol to an idealized version, where you could, for instance, think about how do two different protocols compare to a same ideal functionality? What would be their distance? And maybe judge whether one, uh, one protocol would be would be better than another one uh, in, in that context. But as I said, this is much more quantitative. So, okay, um, thanks a lot uh, for listening to me and I'm happy to take any questions.
All right. Thanks, Steve, for a very interesting talk. Uh, any questions from the audience at this point? Mm, okay. In this case, I have a question uh, to start with, and this question is about the schedulers. So, yes. Okay, so if I understand correctly, this uh, uh, very interesting result about uh, uh, similarity sufficing here is in the context of this um, schedulers um, not being probabilistic, so not allowing, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, well, okay, restricted on the on the schedulers that uh, that you, that you have. If you go back to the slide, yes, further up. So, yeah. So well, one of the things that I should say. So, if you what we have shown is that um, May testing is the same as similarity. Mm -hmm. But for May testing, whether we consider randomized or non-randomized schedulers doesn't really matter. So this uh, randomized versus non-randomized schedulers is actually only important when you're looking at uh, observation. ob observational period or, or, or equivalence. There, it, it makes a difference. Okay. But here for, for May testing that we are characterizing, characterizing using similarity, it actually doesn't matter. And because, so it doesn't matter and we are looking at non-probabilistic processes in order to have this, this uh, equality here and so similarity actually doesn't need any scheduling here because we are non-probabilistic processes and similarity doesn't put any adversary in parallel so this is actually the usual similarity that we know from the completely fully non-deterministic case so without probabilities so here this difference doesn't really matter. But if you want to go for um, observation equivalence, there it is important to have um, to have uh, yeah this uh, this randomized schedulers. And the same thing also holds if you want to have, uh, for instance, similarity on probabilistic processes. Mm. There we know that um, the definition, if you don't take um, Randomized scalar is actually it's actually not good. It's actually it's not even transitive. What you what you receive as a relation using the natural definition. Maybe you could come up with a strange definition, but the natural definition is not even transitive. While it is, if you're taking randomized schedulers, so it's it's a kind of a technical insight, but nevertheless um, quite important if you want to add probabilities to the processes that you are that you're looking at. If you, for instance, want to think to reason about dining cryptographers or, or protocols like that that have probability, mm -hmm. and you want to look at something that is not just May testing or May testing, but something above, there you really need to consider the, the randomized schedulers. Okay, but um, mm, I have a question. So these definitions, uh, which uh, in general, I'm well, not uh, so recently familiar with, they seem to take into account a specific, so my question is uh, looking in general at schedulers and I understand the, spe the, the specific point that you made, but the, the point is that the way in which we order the quantification between the schedulers and the adversaries does matter. So the problem that you have with the, um, with the schedulers being randomized is because the quantification seems to be for any scheduler for no adversary can possibly distinguish that process the processes whereas i can also imagine a world in which i look at some uh, equivalence uh, or distinguishability property whereas the order of quantification uh, where the order of quantification is different where i would it's a weaker property of course in which i would say for any adversary um, there, yeah, for, for any adversary, for any scheduler, there is no distinguishing capability of the processes. And then, therefore, the adversary comes before the scheduler and it, yes. it doesn't matter. So here's a very strong notion in which the adversary actually um, can be constructed based on the scheduler as you want, if you want. Uh, whereas I can also imagine a world in which this is not the case for weaker distinguishability properties. Is this something that people are looking at or is there something that they're not looking at or am I missing something here? So I, I think this makes perfect sense. So um, 
So the first, maybe one first part of the answer is that we have been looking at these definitions because they are conservative in the sense that if you're going, for instance, uh, for similarity on non-probabilistic processes, all our definitions, which are nevertheless with the distribution and everything, coincide with the normal similarity mm -hmm. definition. So you, if you're applying our definitions to, to the non-probabilistic case, you get back the normal uh, simulation by simulation and everything. So this is, mm -hmm. this is one first, uh, first thing, why I think that this nevertheless makes sense. The other thing is that there has been work actually by um, by, by Kostas Shatsikoukalakis and Katusha Palemide, mm -hmm. what they call, call safe equivalences, where they think about different kind of um, ordering of, of, uh, of quantifiers that goes into that direction. So there has been some work on it, but only very few work on it. So mm -hmm. um, the third thing that I might say is that um, the leaking schedulers, they actually always give too much power to the attacker, mm -hmm. I think. So if you can nevertheless show some equivalence, you're safe. Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, but uh, and mm. yeah, if adding, for example, a randomized scheduler would be very hard to obtain a result for observational equivalence as it stands with the quantification being for all schedules for all adversaries. One can also think that you could look at the quantification for all adversaries for all schedulers. In a sense, for security, that makes some sense. That sort of quantification makes some sense because you can think that the attacker can the attacker distinguish this particular, this particular fixed uh, scheduled setting or this other particular fixed scheduled setting. Um, so that 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 would make sense for security, and it might be easier to solve with randomized uh, schedulers if the order is different. Yeah, yeah, maybe so. But the idea is really also to say that basically the schedulers, they are not, we don't know how they will act. Um, mm. Before they were saying, okay, they can make an arbitrary choice and we're going a little bit further by saying we can take an arbitrary distribution over the choices. So that's, that's the difference with what we had before. About the leak, um, there has been nevertheless also work on saying like, if two systems are indistinguishable in some sense, then the scheduler should also take the same choices. And so this is also, I think, an interesting direction uh, about thinking about if they have, if they look similar, then the first, then the the scheduler should not be allowed to take different choices. But this is. This is what, uh, what we have in our future work, kind of um, formalizing this, uh, this intuition that actual schedulers should behave in the same way when they, they look at similar systems. Even though, of course, the scheduler, as it is um, written here, basically has a complete, has full, full mm -hmm. knowledge of the system. And so you, what you would actually like to have is the scheduler that only has a partial knowledge of the system and so cannot basically distinguish too much and only make reasonable choices. Okay, that so, makes sense. Okay. Uh, thank you for your answer. Uh, any other questions from uh, the audience? Tom. Hi, um, great talk, thanks a lot. Uh, I wondered if you have had any examples of protocols with probabilistic vulnerabilities. Um, so, hi Tom, uh, thanks, great question. Um, no. <laughs> so, uh, so the thing is, um, before I did this work, actually, I was always thinking like um, taking mate testing or observational equivalence doesn't matter. For me, it was kind of, well, there are some examples, but basically, which one you take doesn't really, really, really matter. Of course, then we have this, um, this toy example that I gave at the very beginning, which is kind of the motivating example was the one decryption oracle call, which is, of course, a made up example. Um, I don't have any example of a real life protocol where um, this, the thing, this probabilistic choice would matter. So currently, I don't know. But um, there has been interesting recent papers um, by people from Luxembourg about unlinkability where they actually have very subtle differences. So this is going back to, to the attack on passports that you very well know, I think. 
um, where they had very subtle differences about uh, whether they had their, what they call open bisimilarity. But I think they could also have differences between taking bisimilation or rather taking mate testing. And so I would need to look into this, whether you can actually also explain this in terms of a probabilistic attacker. I, uh, I really don't know, but maybe okay. it would be. So that's, that would be uh, one thing I really need to do is to check whether I could actually think about this as being, as giving more power to the attacker in terms of, of probability, probabilistic choice. That's not impossible, but I'm not sure. Okay. It, Interesting you mentioned the Luxembourg work, because I very really didn't say it. I think part of our results were based on distinguishability of channels. If I understand that work correctly, the weaker by simulation they looked at couldn't distinguish between a passport in one location and a passport in another location. But if you labeled the channels, then their results change. Yes. So would you see the same kind of thing with your... Uh, well, basically, so if I, if I get it right, is that you're saying if every passport has its own channel, which basically says this is the location um, exactly. that is modeled by this, then we're getting actually very close to this uh, determinate class of processes. And there we know that, um, well, just, just before in my picture, where all of these equivalences actually coincide. Right. So, so if I built my model with named channels for different locations, then the equivalency yeah, I would say, well, if, if this makes the process determinate what basically is very possible to happen, then actually all these uh, equivalences start to coincide. So in particular, showing trace equivalence shows me similarity, which means it also shows me uh, mate testing in the presence of uh, or a probabilistic adversary, because we don't have any probabilities in the process itself. But is that not often a more re realistic attacker model? But I, I'm talking to a device, I will generally know which device I'm talking to. Um, it, again, uh, it depends, for instance, if you think about uh, a, prob a property such as anonymity, and if you're saying that every, every, uh, every role or every entity has its own channel, but then it doesn't really make sense anymore to model uh, anonymity in that way. So it really depends on the application. If you think about this as being just on the internet, yep. you, see, you, you see actually some, some conversation going on on, an, let's say, anonymous channels, imagine Tor or something like that, but well, then it doesn't really make sense. Or if you cannot really link, um, know from whom the, the message is coming. Yep. That's a very good point, thank you. Okay, thanks, Tom. Yes, uh, can uh, I say something to this point? So if you go to your original example, so to que Tom's question, where you had two outputs, the uh, 001 and 00, this yeah. one, this was your motivating example. Yes. So this is a very good example that can be transferred to, for example, as you say, an unlinkability or anonymity. So you imagine I have a number of sessions, myself as a device, uh, I'm process P, and in some sessions I output a, a zero, and in other uh, sessions I output one, or in some sessions I do this, and in some other sessions I do that. Uh, then this uh, equivalence here transfers to some sort of a session linkability. Am I able to say that in one execution, in some sessions I output more often zero, and in other sessions I output more often one? So this, in my opinion, is a very realistic example for unlinkability over multiple sessions. So I execute multiple times. Can I say can I say that one execution I more frequently do X, whereas in the other one I more frequently do Y? So in my opinion, this is quite realistic. Because uh, okay, you said this that. it's a toy example, but I think it's very telling of of whether you could tell different behaviors in multiple executions of a process. So a type of unlinkability. Yeah, I, I think this this example is, is quite appealing. It, it, it shows really that um, that we are missing something if we consider mate testing equivalents. And mm -hmm. it's just basically telling you if you if if you if you want to consider probabilistic attacker, 
Mm -hmm. But then you should go for something stronger, being similarity, if you want. Exactly make this. Or go for by simulation, uh, which of course then implies similarity and uh, and you're, you're safe as well. But then there are also examples where sometimes by simulation is too strong. So, so I, I yeah, at least it, it definitely tells us that um, May testing is, 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 missing, uh, is missing probabilistic adversaries. Even though it has this very intuitive um, definition saying you can put any process in parallel, but the mm -hmm. language is not expressive enough in some sense. Of course, it has also a flavor of this unlinkability, but then it's very particular in the sense that you have one decryption call here. Of course, but sure. you could say, uh, well, maybe you cannot, maybe you can only relay a few messages to, to a device if you think about about relaying a text or things like that. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, I don't have any uh, good real life example currently, but uh, I'm pretty convinced that uh, that it makes a case for uh, for saying that that we might be missing things when only considering main testing equivalents. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, well, uh, we're a bit above uh, beyond the time. Are, are there any other questions at the moment?